To continue our conversation about Joe Biden's student debt relief plan, I'll now be speaking with Astra Taylor, who's an author, filmmaker, and the co-founder of The Debt Collective. We're also going to be joined by Marshall Steinbaum, an associate professor of economics at the University of Utah, who has done a ton of deep dive research into student debt, its effects on the country, and also on what the implications of a debt relief plan will be uh, for uh, lower income folks and communities of color. Hey, Astra. Hey, Marshall. Hello. Great to be here. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, student debt relief, not something that lots of people thought would even be possible, much less talked about, much less a piece of it actually happening. Uh, if you got in a time machine 10 years ago, that was just not really a thing that was uh, considered a realistic idea. And so I want to start with with Astra, who's been involved in the organizing uh, for the pressure that ultimately resulted in this student debt relief decision. Just to contextualize this discussion, Astra, why don't you just give us an overview of how the modern version of this student debt relief movement really started and how far it's come, just to let people understand how big a journey it's been. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I think even if you went back in a time machine five years ago, the vast majority of people wouldn't think this was possible. I mean, it, it really sort of became a mainstream issue around the 2020 Democratic primary. That's when it you know sort of was legitimized on that national stage. Um, but, you know, 10 years ago, I was one of the many people who joined the Occupy Wall Street movement. And, you know, out of the gate, <laughs> what was clear to us was that debt was a crisis for so many of the people who were at the encampments. And it makes a lot of sense when you think that that was the aftermath of the 2008 mortgage crisis, which was all about debt. Uh, and it wasn't just that millions of people had their homes foreclosed on. I mean, jobs evaporated. So people were struggling to pay their bills. And what happens under conditions like that? Well, you do what you're told to do. And I know Marshall's going to pick this up and you go back to school. You think the economy is bad. I'm going to go get credentialed. So I might have a chance of having a livable life. Uh, uh, so people were out of work. And what happens in that moment? Well, then you borrow, right, to make ends meet. Um, but really, it was a, a forum. I mean, Occupy is, was as much of a school as it was a protest. And it was a forum where we started to talk to each other about our economic realities. And we started to study the financial system. So we started to study and we started to build solidarity. And out of that, eventually, you know, came the idea of a debtors union. What if debtors actually banded together in a formation complementary to the labor movement? complementary to other forms of organizing and said, look, we, we recognize our debts as assets. Let's start building power collectively to demand what? The cancellation of unjust debts and the provision of the things we need so that we're not forced into debt. So we have medical debt because there's not universal health care. We have student loans because there's not free or higher, higher education. That sounds great. It's easy to say what should happen. The real challenge was building the power and finding those levers, to use a word you probably like, <laughs> those levers along the way. So we launched a debt strike of uh, amongst students who had attended a massive for-profit college chain called Corinthian Colleges. It's a college that served hundreds of thousands of students. A couple of that with really creative legal strategies saying, hey, actually, Department of Education, we actually know you have the power to erase these debts uh, and started to win a trickle of relief under Obama um, and showed that that actually debt cancellation is possible. But it really was by the organizing work is, you know, building relationships and figuring out just step by step what that next thing you can achieve is, what that next thing you can win is. Because we started by by erasing millions of dollars of debt with an M through our rolling jubilee thing, which we bought and erased debts on the secondary market. Then we started winning a few billion dollars under Obama, a trickle of relief. And then once Biden was in office, you know, starting to to win on a much bigger scale. So that's why I see this as so significant as a and as a stepping stone, because I've done the work to know that you don't get it all at once, you know, and this has knocked a hole in what was a wall, you know, because now you got all these people thinking I'm entitled to get my debt canceled. And that is a huge shift in consciousness. So with that context in mind, I think the other context that's so important here is to really for a moment to understand how much of a problem Joe Biden was on this issue up until this point. I mean, I've said before that Joe Biden effectively led the campaign to create the student debt 
situation over 30, 40 years uh, in, in the Senate. Um, Marshall, I'll, I'll ask you, I mean, is that a fair characterization? What do we know about Joe Biden's relationship to the student debt issue up until now? Yeah, I think it's a fair characterization. I, there were many decades there where the federal policy was effectively to expand uh, student lending as a means of increasing federal revenue, because what they thought was basically that causing students to take on debt would make money for the federal government because it would be lending money to these uh, 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 credit risks and they would more than pay back what uh, had been lent out. And that fact was used to uh, cut taxes for the rich and many other things. That is to say, there were all these um, uh, spending bills and tax bills where the so-called pay for was let's expand federal student lending um, because that shows up as revenue positive, according to the Congressional Budget Office scoring mechanisms. And that's exactly how we got to where we are. So as you mentioned, Biden uh, was a, a leader on the uh, so-called bankruptcy reform of 2005. That was basically a credit card industry bill um, that was designed to shift bargaining power and bankruptcy proceedings in favor of lenders uh, and make it more difficult to get out from under debts. And it was all uh, kind of premised on this uh, false ideology of debtors being sinful, of being irresponsible and needing to sort of pay for their own mistakes uh, by, uh, uh, you know, not having a court bail them out in that case. Um, so it's notable how uh, much the ideology has shifted uh, in the last you know, a couple of years such that we got last week's announcement about uh, canceling student loans. So we're going to get into that in, in one minute here, but I want to just re echo something that both of you have alluded to. Because I think it's gotten lost a little bit in the in the discourse about student debt. We as a society have like sort of the American dream idea has been premised on the idea, go get an education to better yourself. And we as a country are saying that and then saying in order to do that, you have to go into crushing debt. I bring this up because a lot of the discourse about student debt has been, well, you know, you took out a debt, it's your responsibility to pay it back. Uh, and if you screw that up, that's your problem, that's on you. But at the same time, our culture is saying, in order for you to better yourself, to better effectively the country, the macro economy, uh, to be a productive member of society, putting that in quotes, you have to get an education. So I feel like there are two messages that don't exactly make sense. Either it's on you to take a risk and um, uh, if, you, if, you, if the economy goes south, if you can't get a better paying job, then too bad for you. And yet the American dream, uh, the American the sort of patriotic, you know, flag waving America idea is go get an education to better yourself. I mean, these two things are are kind of incongruous uh, together. And I think that's been lost in the conversation. So I want to turn to the conversation, uh, the discourse about this. First, let's talk about whether this is a, uh, I guess, how good of how big a victory this is. To my mind, this is a partial fulfillment of what Joe Biden was pushed, essentially pressured to support in the Democratic primary. So Astra, I'll ask you, how big a victory is this? What are the best parts of it? What are the uh, most disappointing parts of it, at least so far? Yeah, I mean, it's it's mixed. I mean, this is why I said that it was it was a stepping stone. I mean, the debt collective, the union for debtors that I organized with has always been really clear that we want full debt cancellation and that that is the reasonable demand. I mean, the reasonable demand is to cancel all debt, return to the model of free public college, you know, uh, not demand that everybody get a credential, a higher education credential to be able to earn a living wage. I mean, the solutions are obvious, right? So we're, we're trying to build the political pressure to get there. I mean... <laughs> I think we have to measure this victory against who we were bargaining with. And, and that was Joe Biden, who has spent his career serving the interests of creditors. This man is not a friend of debtors. And so to see his Twitter last night <laughs> boosting the stories of debtors being released from the shackles of debt as though he were leading a debt debtors assembly that the debt collective often hosts was surreal, you know. So and you're absolutely right. He only did this because he was boxed in on the campaign trail by 
a movement that had shown not only is debt cancellation desirable, right, people want it, but that it's actually legally possible. And so Bernie coming out for full cancellation, Elizabeth Warren demand, you know, sort of validating our theory of executive action were key. And he did not want to do this. Believe me, Joe Biden did not even want to do what he did. <laughs> he thought this was yet another promise that he could let fall by the wayside. And a movement kept his feet to the fire. Uh, I mean, I think they were making up their minds to the last minute. That's why. So now to get into the, the real failures, there's no application yet for people to apply for this relief. The fact they're even saying there is going to be an application. Marshall and I co-authored a memo <laughs> laying out with data, which supposedly neoliberals love, why this is a totally failed approach, right? The only, So this should have been, um, you know, even if they weren't going to do full cancellation, because again, we're, we're dealing with the corporate Democratic Party, it should have been automatically administered. <laughs> and the fact that they're making people jump through this hoop in order to sort of send out the vibes like, oh, yeah, we're filtering out these imaginary rich debtors who have negative net wealth, who are, you know, uh, are not rich. They've taken out student loans. So that's proof they're not rich. They're actually in practice going to filter out millions of people who are actually vulnerable. And so that is catastrophic. And civil society groups like the Debt Collective are going to be picking up the pieces, helping debtors. We're volunteers. It's completely unjust. You know, we should be billing the government for the help that they're going to need so that people get this relief. Um, you know, so it's mixed. I obviously feel very conflicted. I have one si sibling. Her household's going to get $40,000 canceled. That's big, you know. And then I have another sibling who is a lawyer who works with elderly indigent clients making 50 grand a year, and he has a quarter of a million dollars of law school debt. And this is like nothing for him. It's a joke. So, you know, this this is why, but this is why emphasizing the organizing is so important because it's like, you know, these, these are crumbs, but they were handed down because people fought for them and we just need to keep going. And right now, millions of people think they're entitled to debt cancellation. For the United States of America, that is huge, man. That is huge. That is, entitlement. Is huge. Entitlement is what we want to cultivate. You are entitled to a decent life. You are not a debtor. You are a creditor. You are owed a decent life. And this can help build us towards that goal. Yeah. And ultimately, the, the, the ultimate folks who feel entitled, and this is where the shift really, the paradigmatic shift really is, is that the people at the top have felt entitled for as long as I've been alive. Uh, the recipients of the TARP bailout, the 13 bankers, uh, NFL uh, pro sports teams owners who get uh, bailed out for their uh, stadiums all the time. I mean, the wealthy, the Trump tax cuts, uh, the mortgage interest tax deduction, the pass through tax cuts. I mean, I could go on and on the PPP recipients, right? I mean, that's a program where 72% of the benefits went to the top 20% of income earners. Th this is considered not a scandal. This that is considered not controversial entitlement for those at the top. And I agree with you. The entitlement, there should be some entitlement for everyone else. And I think that's a, that's a really important point. And I just want to echo your point about, about means testing effectively or burying people in the paperwork, the application. I have said this before. I'll say it again. All of those hoops that people are forced to jump through when it comes to government spending are designed to prevent people from accessing benefits that they have a right to access for no other reason. That's what it's, it's there to deliberately bury you in paperwork. That is what that is. And I think on the politics of it, it's actually terrible politics. I had suggested a little while ago, Joe Biden should just send out a letter to like 50 million households. One line in the letter, dear household, your student debt was X. Now it's Y. Thanks to my decision on this date, signed President Joe Biden. Like, Sorry, I was going to say the Debt Collective has done that for tens of thousands of people through our Rolling Jubilee. We buy debts and we send them those letters. And we were like sending copies of our letters to, you know, t tweeting at the administration. That's good like, politics. It feels good. Do it. Right. And, yeah, the and, Republicans, it's good politics. Right, and, the, and the Republicans would scream and they'd whine and they'd cry. And Joe Biden would be like, look, I just made 50 million people happy. Right. 50 or you know, like that's good politics. Now, Marshall, I want to turn to you because we have heard a lot of pushback from a lot of uh, coincidentally very wealthy pundits uh, saying that this student debt relief plan um, isn't fair. <laughs> They've met, And what's interesting about it is. As far as I can tell, the people making this argument are, as I said, very wealthy, but they're pretending to care about working class people. And there's example after example after example of television pundits, media pundits, affluent folks saying this is bad 
for uh, this is forcing working class people to pay off the debts of kind of rich, lazy uh, uh, kids uh, who don't really want to work hard. What does the data say about who benefits from this and about the fairness question that these affluent folks are raising? Yeah, so I've been studying now for years the fact that student debt is actually held by a broad swath of uh, working people in this country, and in particular, young working people. So as to what you were referring to earlier, we have been telling people to go to college um, as a means to secure middle class status, and uh, they took that advice, basically. And the open handedness of the federal student loan program on the front end uh, at the behest of universities and employers um, has accomplished its end in that respect of more and more people going to college and taking on more and more loans in order to qualify themselves for the uh, with the so-called skills necessary for today's jobs. And that is at the absolute root of of the student loan crisis, and in particularly, and particularly why uh, student debt holdings are so widespread. Um, so it just isn't true that it's wealthy people who have student debt. Among young people, it's wealthy people who don't have student debt. That's the crucial sort of reversal that's happened um, in the last couple of decades. That you know, such that the pundits saying, "Oh, this is a giveaway to the rich," are just. Um, uh, 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 you know, not in touch with reality. Um, one thing that was reported in the memo that Astor uh, talked about earlier is the fact that um, there's a huge variation uh, in terms of who has what amount of student debt, even conditional on uh, income or other socioeconomic status. So what that means is, you know, a lot of uh, pundits will say, well, uh, the higher your student loan amount, the higher your income. And that's true on average, but there's huge variation such that there's you know, much more variation within income groups. So there are poor people who have a small amount of student debt. There's poor people who have a high amount of student debt. There's rich people who have a small amount of student debt. And there's rich people who have a high amount of student debt. Um, and if your mindset is it's rich people who have a high amount of student debt only and not poor people, then you're just going to uh, uh, come up with a policy like we have now, which is an inadequate cancellation for borrowers who really aren't going to be able to repay um, even with ten or twenty thousand dollars deducted from their balance you know they're still basically going to be in the same position um, and that speaks to the sort of false uh, understanding even as the student debt crisis has developed the idea among higher education uh, finance experts has largely been well this is because of the uh, temporary conditions of the great recession or that it takes longer to find a job than we thought it did, but you'll still find a good job. So the solution to that is income driven repayment, where you get a few years of uh, lowering your payments to match your income. And then uh, after that, you'll be able to sort of resume payments and eventually uh, pay down your debt in full. And that is definitely not happening. So, you know, if people I, I join income driven repayment because their income is too low to retire their debts, um, now that is just, you know, kind of a, a, an absorbing state, as we say, in economics. So it's like you'll be there forever until your uh, uh, until you run up against the end of the uh, income driven repayment period and all of your outstanding debt is canceled. So the income driven repayment is basically just a much more bureaucratically onerous form of student debt cancellation that's designed to um, mask the fact that that's what's going on, that all of these debts the government is issuing aren't ever going to be repaid, notwithstanding these uh, CBO budget forecasts that say, oh, this is actually going to make the government a ton of money, so you have budgetary space to cut taxes for the rich. Okay, Astra, I want to turn back to you and play devil's advocate for a second. So I'm going to be the asshole, uh, affluent conservative, and I'm going to make a bunch of arguments, and I want you to respond to them. Uh, Dark Brandon, Joe Brandon's uh, uh, horrible policy is unfair to the people who didn't get their debt relief. Uh, people who just, for instance, let's say somebody two years ago just paid off their student debt. They worked hard. Joe Brandon's policy is unfair to that person. And where does it end? If we're canceling student debt 
$10,000, $20,000 now, where does it end? Are we going to cancel medical debt? Are we going to cancel uh, housing debt? Where does it end? Does it end in complete, you know, the, the, the demise of civilization? That's what you want. You want just everybody gets a free lunch. Everybody wants free stuff. Oh, my God, I sound like such an asshole. Wow. Uh, but <laughs> what's your response to that? This person probably doesn't have better, better angels to appeal to. But the, <laughs> I would try to say I would say to them, look, just because you suffer, it doesn't mean future people should suffer. If I die of cancer, it is not unfair to me that a cure for cancer is invented before I'm able to take advantage of it. And in fact, I would point out the fact that I paid off my student loans. And, you know, I'm in this fight because the truth is, I actually will benefit. I will benefit from a society where my friends and neighbors um, and community are not buried in unpayable debt and where people like my brother can afford to go into public interest law, where people can afford to be dentists in rural communities, where you can afford to be, you know, a, a, a general practitioner instead of an anesthesiologist or whatever the fuck. So, you know, actually, you will benefit. And, you know, it's good for other people not to suffer. Um, as far as the slippery slope, I mean, hell yeah, bring it on. We are coming for medical debt right. because don't, it's don't completely threaten me immoral. With a good time. That's right. <laughs> you know? Don't threaten me with a good yeah. time. <laughs> it's like completely immoral that people, you know, have to face this incredible financial stress on top of getting sick. And, and the fact is, you know, public, direct public investment is so much more efficient. So I was debating a libertarian the other day. And, you know, my point was, you know, now you're screaming about the cost of college. Well, if you publicly fund universities, you can say, Keep the cost down and also, you know, stop exploiting adjuncts and cafeteria workers. You know, you can put conditions on public money, which they never do, but it's possible theoretically. So, Marshall, what about as, as uh, an economist, what about the fear of inflation? I'm going to go back into the asshole conservative uh, mode for a second. Uh, you know, you can make all your arguments. All you liberals can make your arguments about how uh, this is uh, helps people who are in debt. And that's that's all great. The, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But this is going to just destroy the country because it's going to wildly exacerbate the inflation problem that we're already facing. What's your response to that? Well, that idea is, is pretty ridiculous. Uh, even the people who are mongering about inflation, their own predictions show a pretty uh, minor effect on inflation. And that's assuming that we don't end the student loan repayment pause, which the policy is to end the repayment pause at the same time, more or less, as the debt is canceled. So if anything, I predict that that will be deflationary. My re I'm researching the effect of the student loan repayment pause now, and it shows, you know, households both paying down other debts and spending more as a result of their um, uh, 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 increased um, liquidity due to the not having to make their student loan payments, which I think is a good thing and has been behind the uh, rather successful economic policies undertaken to uh, mitigate the pandemic. You know, they're, if they're ending that, which I don't think is necessarily a good idea, that's going to be deflationary even beyond the debt cancellation. Where I think there's a better, I guess, argument that you could put under the category of inflation, though it's really a fundamentally different right. phenomenon, is higher education costs, which is what Astor was just saying, that you know, the federal government is shoveling out a uh, hundred and something billion dollars of new student lending every year to help people pay tuition. Um, and that's th the policy that was announced the other day doesn't affect that at all. Um, and in particular, the income driven repayment uh, plan that's much more generous, you know, that's kind of the, the the plan should be understood as an outright cancellation for low balance borrowers, the ten uh, ten thousand dollars and twenty thousand for Pell Grant recipients. The income driven repayment plan that's much more generous than the pre existing ones. That's a de facto cancellation for high balance borrowers. Just they don't want to have to say that that's what they're doing, but everyone knows that those debts aren't going to be collected anyway. And so they have this new plan that could have the effect of causing universities to increase tuition more. Now, I really object to the people who are saying, oh, thanks to your student debt cancellation policy, now universities are going to start raising tuition. That's what they've been doing for 30 years. That was our policy was withdraw uh, public support for higher education, shift the funding models of institutions from state funding for at the institutional level to individuals paying tuition, backed up by federal student loans. All the, the higher education institutions love that kind of thing, that, that individualized financing, because it means that there's no accountability and no strings attached, that they can pretend that, oh, students choosing which university to go to will exert the sort of discipline that a regulatory regime uh, would 
uh, would exert when in fact it, it doesn't. So um, they like the fact that there's no cap on tuition and there's no cap on graduate student lending, which is a huge cause of, of high balance uh, uh, student uh, student debtors that aren't able to repay. You know, that is part of the status quo that I, I, if, if any part of the recently announced policy makes that worse, it's the a more generous income driven repayment plan because that really does tell uh, uh, professional schools, for example, to charge high tuition and tell their students there's IDR to pay for it. So you shouldn't balk at this high sticker price um, because you'll never actually have to repay it. You know, that now that incentive is even more uh, is even more present. But my my hope and, you know, I think there's some validation to this hope seeing the outrage reaction to the student debt cancellation is there might actually be political will to regulate the higher education sector and 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 attach some strings to these huge outlays because it is basically funded by the federal government like that's that is their funding model and they have had it uh, both both ways for too long that is they get all of this federal money but they don't actually have to operate in the public interest at all and, and the actual students have to carry this this unrepayable debt and feel that it's their own fault for entering into it and of course, they are the major lobbyists against free public college. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. If you take Donald Trump's tax bill and look at its one piece of it that put a tax on endowments, and then you take Biden's beginning, hopefully beginning student debt cancellation, it almost is like two prongs of uh, two little pieces of reform aiming at a larger solution. Now, of course, Joe Biden doesn't unilaterally have the power to fix the system without Congress, right? I mean, that's this is an imperfect uh, uh, a policy in the in in one sense because he only has the unilateral unilateral power to stop the debt collection. He doesn't have the unilateral power to put in an entire you know reform of the higher education system. So I want to end this conversation and I just throw out a, a kind of simple but leading question here. When I look at the opposition to this, when I look at the pushback from Republican politicians, uh, pundits, uh, sort of old school neoliberal economists, what I see – and you could both tell me that I'm wrong, I'm crazy, I'm a conspiracy theorist. But what I see is something deeper – than just um, a, a wrong-headed analysis. What I see is a a kind of top tier of our society wanting to protect its status, wanting to not allow the prestige of a college education to be financially available to millions and millions of people. I think there is something deeper here, something based on class at work here, that, that the idea of millions of people being able to get a college degree uh, and to get it without going into serious financial hardship is detestable to the people at the top of society. And I also think that at the kind of corporate level, what free higher education can do is take the the handcuffs off of people what without debt you have m much more uh, power to try to go do different kinds of jobs than you may if you have tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt i mean you think about the 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 a lawsuit. They come out of school. They've got a huge amount of debt. The corporate law firm's offering them a huge payout, but they want to go do public interest law. And guess what? The debt pushes them into a decision. So I'm going to throw to either of you, both of you, am I being a conspiracy theorist in thinking that there is kind of underneath here an unstated kind of class uh, hostility to uh, free higher education and to student debt relief? Well, I, I strongly concur with your analysis. I mean, that idea of both class and I want to add a race hostility sure. was yes. super uh, motivating to the move in the first place away from free public college and the California master plan in the 1960s to the Higher Education Act of 1972, which is really where we saw the student loan program kind of balloon up, start to balloon up to what it has become. That in between the, the 
uh, Higher Education Act of 65, which was the first federal act, and the, its renewal in 72, you had the Rivlin Report, which was this sort of neoliberal economist saying how to uh, reform the higher education system. And she proposed student loans, basically, as a means of disciplining campus activists. What I feel is, you know, so the Rivlin Report is very telling about the motivations behind that movement. Um, the other sort of key that I, I like to look to is this book, Academia and Anarchy by James Buchanan, who was a very right wing eco economics professor, uh, covered tellingly by Nancy McLean in her book, Democracy and Chains. At the time, in the late 60s, he wrote this book about academia as a professor at UCLA, basically in, in spluttering outrage at the idea that people who he didn't think belonged on campus at UCLA were there and they were screwing things up. If you look at uh, uh, the John Olin Foundation, which was a major right-wing philanthropy, one of the main motivations for that was this guy Olin, who was an engineering executive or something like that, had gone to Cornell and was a major you know, alumnus and booster of it. He was outraged when campus activists occupied the administration building in like 1968 or something like that and founded the Olin Foundation to prevent that from happening again. So all, all of that is sort of, you know, you can just see this like white middle-aged reactionary uh, upper class uh, person who probably didn't ever like the New Deal, but in seeing the civil rights movement and the uh, waves of activism that it engendered thought like, now liberalism has finally gone too far. Here's our chance to roll it back. And making higher education into this privatized thing was a, a very overtly considered a disciplinary mechanism uh, by, to, by means of achieving that. I mean, Buchanan says that outright in Academia and Anarchy, that if students are encumbered by debt, they'll pay more attention to their studies, they'll be more career oriented, and they won't be as irresponsible. And the faculty will also not be able to get away with their liberal shenanigans or whatever he thought. I mean, that's like, and by the way, it, it echoes kind of the economy at large, right? Private equity, that's what they argue about companies. Private equity, if we can put companies into huge amounts of debt, that will impose discipline on small businesses and companies that we buy up. I mean, this is a whole ideology. And just to echo what you said about the history of this, I mean, the Intercepts piece by the great John Schwartz, Reagan advisor warned that free college would create a dangerous, quote, educated proletariat. So we'll end with you, Astra. How much of the opposition do you think is kind of not about the economics of this in the sense of, you know, uh, uh, oh, oh, you know, it's inflationary or it's going to increase the deficit or the like, that there is something much deeper, much, un much more unstated and much uglier in the opposition to this? 100%. I mean, to the inflation point, the renowned socialists at Goldman Sachs said it's not going to be inflationary, <laughs> right? So, I mean, so often conversations that are ostensibly about economics are actually about power <laughs> and, you know, and and what is going to count as moral, right? So why is it moral for Donald Trump to be the king of debt and have the string of bankruptcies? And yet it's so shameful for a student debtor to default. Um, and it you know, when you really see this, I mean, Marshall just gave this great history, but you you see the uh, residue of that history in the attitudes of economists like Larry Summers and Jason Furman, who were actually there advising Obama on those bank bailouts in 2008, 2009, you know, advocating for the abandonment of homeowners who are underwater, right? Now acting like the biggest scandal on earth is to give $10,000 of debt relief to struggling Americans. And you realize this is not about money. This is about their psychic investments in the status quo. This is about the fact that education has been sold as a ladder to upward mobility, right? Which then allows these people to think they're at the top of a meritocracy when in fact it has served as a sorting mechanism, tracking disproportionately working class people of color into either, you know, the, the school to prison pipeline or into unpayable debt that gatekeeps the professions, right? Because who can afford to be in a professional in America when you have to take on half a million dollars of debt to be a doctor or a quarter of a million dollars of debt to be a lawyer, which is the case for many of Debt Collective's members. So, you know, down with meritocracy is part of what we're we're about at the, at the Debt Collective um, and creating a, a society where education isn't just free as in cost, but free as in really liberating, you know, so people can actually explore their interests and live decent lives. And again, you, know, you shouldn't have to have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD to be able to put food on the table and have security in old age. So I think we're, we're challenging something very deep. Um, you know, an, an, a, an economic model and an ideology and a sense of self <laughs> that is really precious to these folks. And that's why they're so p pissed off. And, you know, hopefully we'll just continue to make them mad in the years ahead.
I, I hope so. I will. I I promise to help continue helping you both make them mad. And I should mention, uh, Astra, where can folks find your work? Where can they find the work of the Debt Collective? Debtcollective.org. And so we are. We have made a lot of progress on this issue through economic disobedience, through debt strikes coupled with other creative strategies. And there is a growing um, campaign committing to non-payment. Uh, when the payment pause is now being turned on, which is December 31st. So we can't let the Biden administration ruin our holidays. People are, you know, going to refuse to pay to try to make this pause permanent because we've seen the government can function without our student loan dollars. And I just want to say that the biggest contingent of that debt strike, um, the fastest growing contingent is actually debtors over the age of 50 because they're kind of the invisible, uh, uh, they're an invisible demographic in this conversation. So we have a f- announced a 50 over 50 debt strike a few, maybe a week ago that has grown into the hundreds, people already threatening to withhold over $35 million of debt. So, you know, it, the fight's not over. And uh, and part of what we're trying to do is ca- get rid of that shame. People who are in debt feel and say, no, we can't pay. We won't pay. We shouldn't have to pay, um, you know. And uh, so I invite people to find us there. Strike debt on Twitter and de- debtcollective.org. And Marshall, I know we can find your work on your Twitter feed, which is at econ underscore Marshall or at marshallsteinbaum.org. I want to just say, uh, and I'm, actually this applies to both of you, that I feel like I have become educated on this issue uh, beyond just reporting on how Joe Biden created the student debt program uh, problem. Uh, I've become educated on that by following both of you. And so I just want to thank both of you for all of your work. And I want to encourage everybody listening to go follow Astra and Marshall, uh, go check out the Debt Collective uh, and get educated on this issue. Thanks to both of you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, David. This has been great.